So today it's a real pleasure to welcome one of soccer's all-time greats, Christine Lilly. Uh, over an amazing 23-year player career, she made 353 appearances for the U.S. national team, a record that's never been broken, 130 goals, professional player in Sweden and with the Boston Breakers, twice women's World Cup champion, two Olympic golds, and much more. So Christine, connecting in from Boston, uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here and I'd love to see you guys uh, and talk great some stuff. Great to have this. And um, joining us from London, uh, Cover Coaching co founder, also a longtime mentor and friend of Christine's, uh, Alf Kalustian. Welcome, Alf. It's my pleasure, especially to see Christine, because, like you say, I mean, we go back when she was, I'm not going to tell you how many years. God, it evolved. Yeah, and it says how old I am. I can't. Uh, you a little girl, <laughs> but it's uh, it's been fantastic. To, you know, being a a plus in my life. Thanks, Alfie. Well, we'll go into that um, in lots of detail. Uh, I'm Mike Smith, network lead at Curva Coaching. Uh, I'll be your Curva podcast host today. So let's start, Christine, uh, with you as a player. Let's talk a little bit about that. So. I think you know as starting as a young girl right when you were a young girl starting out there were very few female role models in soccer in the u.s so what was it about the game about soccer that that caught your imagination what was it that pulled you into the game yeah well um you know what pulled me into the game um, i share the story a lot especially with uh more so probably for adults because they'll remember this. Um, when here in the states, whenever we had games uh, halftime, they always brought orange slices. So we, <laughs> I loved the orange slices. We'd cut them up, and then I would see how many I could eat. Um, so that was something I. When I think about my young, like young time playing, besides like I, my first team, I think it was light blue. I remember the light blue shirt and the orange slices at halftime, and that was really my taste of, of of soccer and the other part that i remember more so is my brother played so whatever my brother wanted to do that's what i wanted to do uh and then obviously after the taste of that um playing from what my brother did in orange slices i just started to love the game what is it about soccer that, that it that can attract young players do you think well, um, I think the concept of tr running and trying to kick is quite hard. So I think when kids to start to figure out how to touch the ball, that becomes something like, oh, wow, this is pretty amazing. Because no other sport really encompasses your foot <laughs> doing everything. Uh, so I think that's something that when young people start to figure that out, it becomes just like an uh, eye opener and just like some freedom. And I can remember just as a young player, um, I felt most comfortable on the field. I think when I started just to feel the freedom of playing and and started to act, actually do some good things with the ball and and be creative, um, it was just a place that I felt most comfortable. And I think you know may, maybe different athletes find it in different sports, but it was for me it was for, it was soccer. How few you, you came uh, across you know this budding star Christine Lilly at a tournament in New York. Tell us a little bit about that when you were just starting out with Curva Coaching with uh, Charlie. Yeah, so um, it, uh, she was, let, let's, without putting dates on it, she was about 13, 14, and it was a tournament in Lake Placid, and it was uh, an open tournament, you know, all ages, right? And Charlie and I, you know, I mean, our background, we, you know, European football, and we, we didn't really know about the women's game. And anyway, we were asked to give the MVP for the men open. It was not, not girl, girl, but uh, boys and uh, girls. It was men's open and women's open. And uh, so we watched the games. It was in the Olympic Arena mm -hmm. in Lake Placid. And, it was, you know, they put a carpet down, which we'd never seen either, you know, in all our playing days. And <laughs> oh, carpet, and, you know, carpet. Anyway, um, and, uh, well, she, she, Christine just stood out. I mean... We, she got the open MVP for the women, but I've said, Charlie, we've got to give it to her. She's better than all the boys, <laughs> all the <laughs> men, right? And, and, and so it was, it was kind of like, I think the first time I'd ever sort of uh, had any sort of experience with the, the, girl, the ladies, the girls game, right? I never, never saw it before. And Charlie too, you know, so it was a real, I 
probably sort of uh, it was the beginning of our interest in in the girls game and i've got to say that christine was like that if if that's uh, an example of how good the girls are then this is a serious uh, game you know christine yeah just in preparation yesterday i looked on youtube and uh, you know the 15 greatest goals of christine lily so just to you know just to kind of remind myself what it's all about uh, <laughs> And and what your trademark was, you know, and your trademark were well, your left footed, right? So yes. was this left footed player hammering, absolutely hammering goals in from twenty yards, yeah, into the reverse top corner, yeah, <laughs> and goalkeepers, you know, just just flailing to do that. So how did that goal scoring skill? How did you develop that? When did that develop? You know, I I it's funny when I think back to my younger days, I don't. I don't think I grew up being a lefty. Hmm. I think I I was, um, I don't remember as a young kid being a lefty. I just remember a little bit older, like maybe like when I say young, like five or six, I think more like 11 and 12, I remember more using my left foot. Um, but I just remember just practicing, <laughs> you know, doing the skill over again. And, and more so I remember this um, in high school, uh, you know, when, growing up we didn't have a lot of opportunities let alone places to play i didn't you know there was no girls playing so boys but i would just go outside and kick the ball against the wall um, and repetition and do things over and over again and that was something i did or i juggle in the yard or you know when obviously when i got the taste of the curver coaching method doing we called them curvers where we were it was ball mastery work um that we would do over and over and over again so i think it was just practice and uh my left foot was just something that uh, grew from that and the strength like when you say my goals are all the power shots is that i rarely score many finesse finishes <laughs> uh, which is okay or headers um but yeah i just uh, when you when it, there's nothing like when you can hit that ball you had no when you strike that and it's knuckling and you hit it perfectly and you don't even have to look up and you know it's in uh so it was just it was just work and um something I'd love to do. Yeah. Scored over 130 goals. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember any special goals? You know, if, if you close your eyes and imagine, you know, some yeah. of the, do you still see them? I do. I see, I can still see one my first goal I scored for the U S team. It was a uh, ball was played high into my uh, teammate, Karen Jennings Gabera, who was probably one of the best forwards uh, ever. And I remember her, you know, kind of, trapping it and then popping it up for me and i kind of hit a half volley and it went in and i was like oh my god i just scored my first goal ever yeah. um and then i remember going 2023 world cup there was two of my score there are two of my favorites and uh there was a ball coming back bouncing and i just connected it went you know like you said upper left side of the goalie upper 90 and just was a seed it was just felt good so you can still feel those and oh like, yeah you uh, can yeah. i can't remember a lot of other things but <laughs> <laughs> But on the other side, um, you know, lying awake at night or whatever, do you, do you ever think back at the ones you missed? You know, it's the other side of football, right? Uh, and sometimes that greatly outnumbers the, the, the ones that went in. But do you, how do you handle that as a player? Because I'm sure that the what ifs are almost, we almost had it. How do you handle yeah. that? You well, know, you as a gotta, you got to let them go. I, I'm, I'm trying to teach my 16 year old. I go, when things go wrong, she gets really down. I'm like, you got to let it go. I go, the game continues to play. So you got to just put that aside and think the next one I'm going to do better. And if that doesn't work, you got to keep saying it over again. But there was one specific um, game. It was the Olympic final in 2000 against Norway. And I remember getting the ball on the left side uh, inside the box. And I had an angle for a shot and I took it. And I had probably the best goal scorer in the world square across from me that if I just passed it to her, she might have just tapped it in, Mia Ham. <laughs> and I can see that, like, I could see me taking the shot. After. And then obviously I didn't see her because I saw her, I would have passed it to her. And I see the angle of my shot. It was, wasn't bad, but it was a tough, it was, you know, the goalkeeper had the near post covered and everything. And I, going wide was, the angle was too tight. And I just, I, every time I'm like, gosh, if I just pass it to her, we might have another gold medal. Um, but you can't do that. You got to do what your instincts are. And I tell my kids, you know, do what you think is right at the moment, because mm -hmm. if you start to question yourself, then you're not going to do anything right. 
Um, so there are those moments, but you got to keep going. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Mia Hamm. She obviously mm -hmm. didn't hold that against you. I was reading a couple of quotes from I, your, your teammates and uh, uh -oh. she did. I, I don't know. But, but when asked about you, she said, Christine, what was special about Christine? She said, Christine mastered the ordinary that made her extraordinary. Oh, that's really nice. Mm -hmm. You know, talk about if you're now talking to 14 year olds, yeah. who want, you know, they dream about going on to the next level in football, all right, in soccer. And um, what does it take, you know, to to be the extraordinary? Yeah. And to talk about that, what Mia said about that. Yeah, well, I think uh, it's true. Um, I mean, not saying that about me, but in general, like the greatest players. They do make the they make the easy thing. I mean, the hard, uh, easy things look really easy. The hard things look easy. And yeah. I think what um, I'd like to tell kids, it's not about the fanciness. It's not about this or that. It's about doing a single cut correctly, a double cut correctly. You know, I teach these as. Uh, these touches for these kids, the ball mastery work that I've learned from Alf through the years. And I go, this is the game. Like if you can master these skills from every surface of your foot, the other stuff's going to come easy. Mm -hmm. So I think at a young age and, or more so even like high school and college, um, you know, Anson was my coach at North Carolina on the U S team. And, you know, he, he, he taught, he showed us the curvers. We, we stole that from you and he created that name. Um, and that's what we call them. And me and I still say it to each other. And, mm -hmm. but it's, the, it's the ball mash. It's the basics. It's using every surface of your foot and you feel comfortable. If you can go in and out inside and outside of one foot and then inside and outside of an, to the other foot, you're solving pressure. You're just getting away. You can beat a player. And it's just the, the simple things that you master that, that help your game extraordinary. And I think if you look at Mia, can do that too. Mia can cut on a dime with the outside foot, outside cut, all these simple things. Even mm -hmm. Ronaldo, you watch him, he does the scissor 6,000 times. <laughs> and in fact, if Charlie Cook, I've seen him do it. What do I do? The scissor a hundred times. I mean, he's not, you know that that's going to happen, but it's still effective. It's the sim simple mm -hmm. things. Messi has that little touch, 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 go, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, I just think these kids think that they have to do this when really the game's here and then you create that. Yeah. Now, uh, what would you add to that? Well, uh, I, I think uh, that when we first uh, had the idea, well, well, when we started, there was really no cur curva curriculum and, and, and uh, um, Christine's mentioning Anson, who I, I think just retired, right? Yes. Great, great coach for the U S one, uh, North Carolina coach uh, uh, is a legend, really, in 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 the game, in my view. And um, yes, I uh, when Charlie and I started uh, um, in '84, we didn't really have a curriculum. Uh, and over these 40 years, we built that curriculum. Um, but uh, Anson was one of the first people who went onto the early curriculum, which which was focused on ball mastery. So ball mastery is really repetition practices, which. Um, uh, uh, the the purpose is to uh, have comfort and control um, in both feet. But I think the word is unconscious automatic comfort and control. So to, to Christine's point, um, and, and, you know, we, we, we didn't discover any, any sort of uh, thing that people hadn't thought about before. We just made a curriculum out of it was that um, if, it, if something's unconscious, your first touch, for example, especially, then you've got more time and space to make decisions, right? So, so you can't have skill without decision making. And so, I think what Kerber was the ABC that you needed to have the time and space to then do whatever you have to shoot or whatever, right? And I think that was where we lucked out. We 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 we, we as, as sort of ex players and 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 and, and co uh, coaches, uh, not even as coaches, but having played the game, it, because you you're quite good at the game, you did quite well. You never thought about these things and when you became a coach or certainly when i became a coach and i think the same with charlie is it suddenly you go, wow well wait a second what we took for granted we actually learned over the years but we now were teachers and had to sort of go backwards and say well what was it that we did well and then it all came back to uh, uh repetition uh, you get ball mastery uh, in Kerber. We have 106 ball masteries over these years. Uh, you repeat things. Uh, when you repeat things, you get this unconscious automatic comfort. And 
which Christine had. I mean, the first time Charlie and I ever saw it when she was a, a kid playing. Um, because what that does give you is, and, and she's not a, a, a she, she's quite small, right? So we, we grew up in being knocked over by big guys and stuff like that. But then suddenly you saw that these lovely uh, sort of skillful uh, small players, the difference was their touch gave them time and space. So it doesn't matter how big you were, you could never get near them, right? And that was the beauty of Kerber for me. And that's uh, uh, the, the, the Christine, I think, it personifies the, the elegance, I think, of, of uh, this method. That's why I think it's so perfect for uh, 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 female players. Um, just the elegance and the aesthetic uh, uh, value, not value, the, the, what football as soccer is. Um, you know, to me, there's that like, beautiful ballet or beautiful music. There's there's an aesthetic value, and I think Kerber actually contributes to that. Mm. I want to just talk about one more thing, Christine. Um, so you're known as a striker, goal scorer. Give it to Christine. You know, kind of won the tactics. Um, but another kind of highlight I saw was this the the World Cup final against China, right? Last mm. minute, mm. Um, where. You, you, you were at the other end, you were defending, you know, okay. the striker's defender, uh, and you ended up clearing the ball off the, the line from a header that yes. would have won the game for China. And um, so just tell us about that, but, but also the, the idea that a striker has to be many things. A good player has to have many sides to them. They can't just be a striker. So what, yeah. are, the mul what are the multifacets of being a striker? But also start off with, what what happened you know yes so <laughs> well, we were speaking about the 99 uh world cup final against china and it was in overtime so china at the game um it was zero zero and we went to overtime um and back then that's when if you score the game was over mm. which i'm trying to, i'm still trying to figure out which i like better uh, <laughs> obviously if you score you want that but um but so we we're overtime and, and Michelle Akers, who's probably, I would say, the best player to ever play, um, had just got uh, taken off the field because she got a collision with our goalkeeper and she wasn't able to come back. And China had Soon Win, who is probably arguably another one of the greatest players. Um, and then they just started to realize Michelle was out. So let's just, we're just driving up the middle of the field. And uh, I remember they had a bunch of corner kicks and this happened to be a corner kick. And my job as on on corner kick, no matter which side the ball is on, is to be on the the right post or the right side of the goalkeeper. So um, left post when you're looking at it. So I was just doing my job. I got some water. I scored, uh, you know, sprayed my head. So it was so hot um, in uh, in Pasadena, California, in July. And I remember the ball flying over, you know, past my post, the near post. And I mean, it was perfect service. And then the Chinese player jumped up and out jumped our players and headed it. And as the time, as the ball was traveling i started to travel with it a little bit because you know you want to go as the goalkeeper moves you want to go to make the goal smaller um and i moved in and then the ball came and then i was like oh my gosh and i headed it <laughs> and then it lands and it's so funny it lands inside the six yard box and there's like three chinese players just ready to go Wah! and then brandy <laughs> cut clears it and then i just like oh my gosh let's get out of here <laughs> so it was happened like that and I think as the game went on and after we won, if someone asked me about it, I'm like, oh, did I even, ha I couldn't even remember, like, you don't remember that that happened. But like everything you do and everything you're part of, your role matters, uh, what your job is matters. So a lot of people, you know, be even players on the sideline that didn't get in the game at all, their job is so important to, maybe they have to have the water ready for us, or maybe your job is when someone comes, you're cheering for them. Whatever it is, you may not like it, but you got to do it. So that is a lesson I tell the kids. I go, this, it wasn't very flattering to be on that post. I'm five foot four, so you don't want me out there trying to head. Um, but then I end up head, they have the biggest head of my life. Um, so you got to do your job um, and you got to do it well and it matters. And those are the kind of lessons I continue to, to, like, to speak because it's not just scoring goals. You got to come back and defend if you're, you know, a midfield position and you got to do your job. And that's what I did. And, um, thankful and it was just one moment in a 120 minute game there was a lot of moments. brian as scurry made a great save at one time carl overbeck won a ball so there's all these moments that add up to the success of our team and that's really what made that team really special
and it won the World Cup for the USA. In my, my opinion, you know, uh, uh, Chris, Christine is known for her, uh, her skills to me, from me anyway. But that one moment of heading the ball, that won the World Cup, in, in my view anyway, yeah. won the World Cup for the USA. That was probably one of the most important part. Of it. Yeah, she, she can tell you, but <laughs> for me as a for me as a fan uh, or admiring somebody that I've worked with, that was I thought oh, interesting. You know, good for you. My, uh, I can yeah. tell you, my story, my brother, like like it happened so fast, and I think yeah, my brother yeah. put his head down, mm -hmm. and then the crowd went crazy. My brother's like, "What happened?" I think my mom was like, "That was your sister." And he's like, "What happened?" <laughs> like, it all just happened so fast. <laughs> yeah. No, it was fantastic yeah okay so uh let's talk a bit now about y your next life as a coach mm -hmm. after after you have finished playing do you still play by the way no but i i just played this past weekend we had a fantasy camp for over 21 uh women um and we had about 85 women come mm -hmm. and it was like a, at a sleep like friday night to sunday so oh. we decided to play on saturday we picked some like 12 all-stars and it ranged from 28 to like 70 these people it was, it was amazing so we played and I, I i got stepped on and i think my toes almost broken and then i turned with the ball and i reached for it and, and i scored because i had to and then i think my whole left leg came off <laughs> so no um i don't play but i only play if i'm playing with tish and mia and they were playing with me so okay so let's talk about then, then coaching. You were coach, um, professional coach of the Boston Breakers, but now you're passing on all this knowledge and love of the game um, to next generation, mm -hmm. particularly through your daughter's teams or, or their club. What, what, yeah. what work are you doing with with your next generation? Yeah. So I mean, I think one thing that I I love to talk about how great the game of soccer is. Uh, as much as I love it and winning and losing, but what the game of soccer has given me so much was is people and the connections that it's created in my life. And Alf speaks about when, when we first met when we were younger. And I do remember when I see that picture, I can vividly remember. And I think I had like this sweatshirt on that had like a bunch of flags, uh, but I do remember that. Um, and then reconnecting with Alf and Charlie um, during the, was it, 94 men's world cup 93 soccer blast tour yes. the world cup uh, yeah so 93 we reconnected they had a soccer blast where they were doing a promotion before the men's world cup in 94 and we travel i would see these guys every weekend um and we reconnected and then now to this day i mean i was, I was my mentor i mean to have someone spend the time that he does um and believe in what I'm trying to do and obviously share his, him and Charlie's business, the Curva coaching um, curriculum, it has been amazing and I believe in it. So it's it's been easy for me to um, want to learn from ALF because of what they have created is something that has helped me in my career. So ALF has been amazing. He's taken the time and helped me create a curriculum for these kids that I'm training. Um, in, a, in a small, uh, like we, I call it an academy, but it's a small club. Um, and also every summer during my camps. And um, it's given me the confidence as a coach to put out a good session because of what I've learned uh, through his tutorials and, and, and love what I do. And the fact that I believe in um, the method, what they have created, makes it easy for me to teach. And I'd like to tell the kids, like the kids are trying to do like these rainbows. I'm like, okay, let's just work, <laughs> work on some ball mastery. Let's do some speed work, some one v one, small group play, and and the small sided stuff. And the curriculum that that I can turn to and know that that's the five things I need to do. I can pick drills from there and go and do it. Is amazing. And like I said, I I've had I have the confidence because of what Alpha has has shared with me and helped me do. And and that's a huge thing. And I hope that I can be a mentor to some young player that wants to be a coach one day uh, because it's been priceless. So you're, so you're about to go into a new season then, September on its yes. way. Mm -hmm. so, so as a coach, how, how do you go about getting organized? You talk about getting the curriculum and getting that all sorted out. Um, it, but in terms of kind of the the, the, the bigger principles, mm -hmm. you know, uh, every coach wants a winning season. Yeah. So how do you define that? You know, this is the, I don't know if I have, define that or figure that out. <laughs> I think what I'm starting to realize as a coach and I'm my my kids are grassroots they're below 13 
uh, 10 to 13 is probably the, the age range. So when I'm thinking of, yes, you want to win because the kids love that feeling. And I believe that every time you step out on a field, you should want that. Um, otherwise, you're you're not going to grow. You're just, oh, if I'm out of one, then I'm just going to kind of need it. So I do believe that you have to have that competitiveness. Um, and it's that fine line of teaching and winning. And I think that's where we struggle a little bit at the uh, in America right now, because it's really emphasized on winning because everybody's job is based on that. So the coach's job, because if you're not winning, then you're not producing, then they're going to get fired. So the, a lot of elements that lead to that. So I'm still trying to find that balance. I'm my perspective with my kids. It's not it's not an, an element where I'm going to get fired. So I try to teach the best I can and um, give them the confidence. If they can leave feeling better about themselves and wanting to come back to practice that week, then I feel like I've done a good job. Mm -hmm. Alf, winning season, uh, your definition or redefinition of, of winning. So um, I think the general trend, and um, as you know, Mike, we've done podcasts with Arsene Wenger and Roy Hodgson and, and the Dutch Hamburger, Dutch technical director, and we've, brought, we, we've talked about this. Um, there's a there is a change happening um, in the pro game. Let's 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 start with the pro game. So the academies, so the academies um, are, are to produce players who are going to the pro game, um, and until the last three or four years, um, they they said winning wasn't important, but it was, and, and that was the sort of uh, uh, DNA of a, a, a successful coach. But um, through FIFA and what Arsenal was saying, um, and then down to UEFA and then uh, all the regions, now there's a thought that between 6 and 16, um, winning, of course, is always important because football is a competitive team game. Any competitive team game you want to win, like Christine says. But, but now there's, um, I think, a redefinition of winning. And we're certainly in Curva uh, coaching and, and our new Diploma 2 uh, hybrid course, um, we talk about that, that um, we want to sort of redefine uh, winning as the score. Yes, you know, I win 2-0, okay. But it can also be between these ages of 6 and, and 16 for boys and girls that they're getting better. Now, the point is, who's the message for? And it's basically for parents. I mean, it's, once you get the parents' buy-in, it's much easier. Um, they're the first people, oh, we're losing, we're losing, we're losing, and the coach is under pressure. Christine knows this as good as I do. And and so if we can re redefine what it means and get to the parents and say, look, um, I mean, it resonates with me with four grandkids uh, who I watch all, all under, under 13, but I go and watch them. I, I just want to see them improving. Honestly, I mean, and I think there's other sort of parents and grandparents like me too. And and um, so I th do think that uh, a red redefinition. Uh, now, are you going to be successful? I don't know. I mean, you know, but but I think we've got to try. And I'm really happy that Arsenal uh, is pushing this at FIFA and uh, that uh, the pro clubs uh, are at least talking that game. Um, well, let's see. But but I think for curve of coaching, it's really important that this word winning is redefined. Mm. Okay. Christine, when when you, you know we talked a bit, a bit about the importance of the basics and mastering the basics and mastering the, uh, the core skills. So uh, so with curve is what we call the curve of coaching five S's. You know, skill, speed, strength, sense, spirit. All these things that a that a player needs and a coach can bring to their players. Um, but I was saying, Kerber, uh, I think if you said that the keystone has always been the core skill, you know, the skill, you, you have to put in the time to learn the skill. So again, how important is the technical skill in this playing of the modern, what you see as modern football? Right. Well, I think when you talk about um, when Alf was speaking about how it's just second nature, your touch on the ball because of the repetition. Uh, I, I mentioned that we, I played in a, we played a pickup game with those with those women this past weekend with Tish and Mia, and Mia. Um, I mean, I I know her strengths. I I know what she does, but one of her character touches is the inside inside. 
Like she does too, too quick like that. And she did it out on the field on Saturday. She hasn't played. Was the last, I mean, I don't know the last time she played besides just randomly with us. But look at that. That's that hasn't changed. That's embedded in her. I mean, when I get it, when I get the ball, I'm doing inside outside real quick all the time. You know, there's just things that you automatically do when you touch that ball because of what you've done. So I think it's spot on with um, what's ingrained in that. And then when you're trying to when I see kids and I'm trying to maybe teach them a different change of direction and they, you know, do it during the court behind. I'm like, well, try this one to, you know, you know, inside cut it in front of you. So it's in front so you can see the ball. Um, they tend go back to their thing. So they, it gets, it does get there and you're going to see players, they have one or two moves. You don't, you don't have like three 10 moves, but if you have that opportunity to be able to reach those, that's, that's the important part, but you're still going to go to your first. But now with back to your question, when you look at the game, uh, I would say more so the women's game is what I'm uh, closer to. I think back in my day, it was like a full, you know, 120 game. Like we played the whole field. And then when I started watching the men's game more frequently, it's it's pretty much half court. You know, you're playing 30 yards in on the attacking. That's where the game is. Mm -hmm. From the middle, from the middle of the field, that's just kind of like, oh, you guys are getting back and da da. The women's game is becoming that a bit more. So what I'm seeing, especially, uh, I mean, watching Spain win the World Cup um, and what they do. So I, I really think that technical skill is super important. And when I say the, just the technical, it's just be able to create space for yourself, which what Corbin, Corbin Method does. And if they can feel confident with us a feint here, you know, uh, just keeping possession is so important. And that's what I've been um, really impressed with, with the development of the women's game, not only from the top, countries hmm. but the, the these countries that are, have haven't had the support and now they're getting the support hmm. colombia i mean they're just they're doing more with the ball hmm. and that i've seen in a smaller area yeah. and i think that's been something that's been an, um interesting to see the growth of yeah well let, let's just finish then the, uh, I, I talk about coaching then christine with just you know looking back at what you've learned mm. last season actually coaching a team you know yeah um, there are a couple of things I think that other coaches would like to hear is what well, what were your biggest challenges? I think I mean, yes, I, yeah, you know you know the game inside out. Yeah. Coaching is is another thing. And how how do you manage those things? What right. what what is your advice for, for well, the coaches two, in the, in the yeah. girls' thing? The two biggest challenges that I think that I still finding the balance of is the first one is what you're teaching. <laughs> So I have these 10 year olds, they don't know how to do anything. <laughs> so it's narrowing what you want them to focus on. I mean, I'll watch a game, we'll work on, um, I don't know, just passing, just, let's just look at passing. And then I'll see them playing the game. I'm like, oh my gosh, they don't get wide. They run right into it. Uh, into where the defenders are. So there's like six things from the game. I'm like, oh my God, we got to work on that. But I was like, oh my, it's too much. So I wasn't, now if you said that I picked up quicker, I, I'm still not very good because I think, oh my God, I have to teach him so much. And then mm -hmm. the expectation of who I am that people have like, oh, well she played, so she must be a great coach. And then I'm like, well, if these players stink, I'm like, <laughs> they can take it out on me. So I think narrowing your focus um, especially with the young kids. I mean, at the older, the professional and national level, I mean, they need to know all that stuff anyway. So narrowing a focus yeah. is something that I think I can still do better. And then also to be a coach, it's not about the X's and O's. It's about the environment. It's the chemistry. It's the kids. Um, it's the it's the atmosphere that you create, the trust and respect they have for you and the trust and respect they have for each other. And that's that's something that makes great coaches. That's Anson. He he could do that. He created an environment where we believed in ourselves, we believed in each other, and we found the way to be successful in doing that. So those are the two big things that I think um, I still can fine tune um, and and work on. Um, the thing with me with with the kids, young kids I have, I don't always have the same kids. So it's not going in season out. There's different kids coming in and out. So creating that atmosphere um, to be a little bit more fun um, is important. And then just teaching, picking two, one or two things for the season, to be honest with you, um, is something that I think I can do better. 
and people could focus on. That's uh, I think that's something. There's just so much that you they could learn that you have to focus on a couple of things. Yeah. Well, it, it's obvious that that you you give a lot as a coach. You want and you want to give a lot, you know, to your kids. What, what do you get back? What's just I don't know one thing. What's your biggest joy? Yeah. <laughs> What's your biggest joy that you get out of coaching? Oh, it just happened to me yesterday. So I mean, I did a camp in this town. Three days I was with these kids. And I probably knew five kids' names, but I I mean, but I obviously talked to them like I knew their name. But there was this one boy, um, his name was Aaron. He was a crafty little player. Um, the first day he was kind of quiet. And the second day I was leaving, he says, Bye, coach. And I was like, well, bye, we'll see you tomorrow. And then the last day, um, granted, I gave out player of the week. We give player of the day each day to, to recognize some kids. And then I, at the end of the camp, I gave a player of the week. And I was kind of watching these kids. And I gave it to him. And then afterwards, he came up. He's like, oh, I wanted to say thank you so much for what you have, you know, been here for these three days. I really enjoyed it. But the smile on his face mm -hmm. was all it took. And the fact that he was a young boy saying to me as a, a female coach, that's what we want to get across. It's not just for these young girls. It's for these young boys to see a female standing before them and having respect for that. And so for me, it's it's really just, coach, thank you. Like I, I enjoyed today. I enjoyed the season. And that's what I care about. I, I, if he never goes and plays professionally or in college even, mm -hmm. I know for that moment, he felt good. Uh, and he felt better as a player, as a person. And that's that's the big picture. Like we talked to wins and losses. Yes, we love that. Um, but these these young kids, that was it was awesome yesterday. He, and he's a cute, cute kid. Cute, cute, cute. It, it's love, isn't it? Uh, that's yeah. that's what it is. If you love something, you you want to do it. I think that's that's it, Mike. Yeah. I mean, we all started because we loved it, right? Mm -hmm. And we we're going to end hopefully in the same sort of yeah. emotional thing you know totally you know i remember in a previous podcast you mentioned the importance of 1v1 the one mm -hmm. uh duel as it were mm -hmm. uh you know and encouraging the use of this in the game particularly in the girls or women's game mm -hmm. yeah um as an option to pass 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 which seems to be a default mm -hmm. uh, so talk a little bit about 1v1 yeah and, and what weights under taught or, or why we should be teaching it more as coaches yeah i i mean that's just the mentality i had i mean that's another thing um anson stole from you alf or actually learned from you i would like to when i talk about anson taking the curvers anson wanted to find all the stuff that he possibly could mm -hmm. that was working to help us be successful and that's when he 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 found out that the curve you know the ball mastery where we just we worked the five i mean there were six two, four, six, six ball mastery moves we did consistently. And then Anson went to Germany and then realized that after practices, Germany ran jog, jog for 20 minutes. So we did that after games. And then the Chinese were so technical, they added a second touch to the inside, outside. So it was inside, outside, outside. So he was trying to find everything possible to help us be the best. And that was 1v1s. I mean, the mentality of the Kerber method in the beginning was a 1v1 situation always on the field. And it still is. So it's in that sense, it's figuring out how to beat that player or how to create um, to be able to pass a shoot or dribble, you know? So those are all the elements of a 1v1 situation. And when you're in the attacking third, one of the things Anson used to tell us as well, if you are have one player to beat um you beat them unless you can pass to someone that will score the goal for sure so i think he gave as attacking players he's like oh, all right anson gave me me the confidence oh if i just have one player i can beat them and then score that'd be great so i think he gave us the confidence in that um and the freedom to i mean there's no one i mean Mia Hamm, I, I watched Karen Gebert tear a, def, a defender apart. But to see when Mia gets the ball in the attacking third, I'm like, okay, this is going to be some magic happening right now. You know, so I think, and that's just a mentality that was taught to us at young age to take on. Yeah. And I think that's a strong one because if you're taught to pass, then you're hesitant to take. But if you're taught to take on, then you're like, well, I beat someone, now I can pass. 
And I think the learning process for young kids, passing comes later because they don't, they can't do it or the people that are receiving it can't receive it. So I think the mentality of uh, ball mastery and taking on is the confidence that kids get. And then you kind of grow outwards from there. Yeah. Alf, anything on, on 1v1? It's It's been one of your big topics. Yeah, other thing that Charles and I have been working on the last two years called the winning zone. So that's 30 meters from goal. So we know that you're outnumbered there, like Christine said. And, when, and we know there's li little space and time. So one way of creating space is 1v1. That's the purpose of 1v1, really. It's not to go past people, um, although it can be an opportunity to run past them once you've made it. But so my point is, um, we're going to call it the winning zone. And, and Charlie and I have com been compiling curriculum, which uh, is what um, Christine and I go through hopefully in the next month or so um, for a new season. And I, I, I just think, um, look, games are won and lost there, right? And and the, 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 the big teams of cotton have figured that out. Um, now, why is it good for grassroots? Well, all, all players, isn't it fun to score goals? Isn't it fun to shoot? Isn't it fun rather than sort of line up and give them the ball and defend right you know which is valid way of playing but but not the curve away but but having said that um the winning zone then is a fantastic play which is 30 minutes from goal to use curve one v ones um so we've got eight change direction eight stop starts eight feints to the curve classics but we've got another little group and it's called the curver crossers and these are one v ones which give you the space to cross the ball so that's also new, Chris. Uh, mm, like and so we're, yeah. we, we've got a lot of work to do. We'll do that in the next one. <laughs> um, but, but I think it's actually simplifying it. So especially when you're working with the, 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 the under 16s that you do, um, mm -hmm. it's, but, you know, I, I, honestly, I, I found after all these years, less is more. Mm. And, and, um, and, and it took me a long, long time to work that out, but, but it's done now. And I really look forward to working with you on that because I think it's going to help you. Yeah. Um, well, it's funny you say less is more. That's just the simplicity of the game. Like mm -hmm. these kids want to do more when you don't have to. Yeah. But, but it does, it, 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 it's, it's weird. You know, when you get the, the, the job as coach or you get, you know, mm. you get that label coach. It's difficult. Less is more. Is you know, you know, you want to prove yourself. I, yes. I was such a when I finished playing, became a coach. I was so r rubbish, right? And it was just because I wanted to, imp you know, hey, I know this game. I've been doing it since I was a kid, and it took me such a long time. I don't know, you know, Christine's more uh, uh, brighter and and quicker than me. Uh, uh, she got she, she got it, you know, mm -hmm. but then. You know, I, I do like this role as mentor because I'm thinking, well, Stan Matthews, Stan was a mentor to me in some way, but n not more generalizing. But but I do think this and, and what Christine said about her mentoring um, other young girls, we, we, we need more girls, in, uh, ladies in, in coaching. We do. You know, we got guys coaching girls, which is fine. But but I'm saying we need and Christine, and I have talked about that so many times. And I think if I can help her and give her the power to do that, she's going to, she's the one that's going to recruit it's too late for me. She's going to be the one that, that's going to recruit it. And I think uh, she's so important. I think um, to, she was hugely important. She's part of football history, soccer history, but my view anyway, um, selfishly talking, I think she, she's got a real chance to actually bring in, more girls to, to become coaches uh, of course as players but more yeah as importantly co coaches because we talked about this chris right yeah it's well it's important because it's like i was just doing a camp for uh, another town uh, uh like uh, north of the city in boston and mm -hmm. uh, at the end they wanted me just to talk to the coaches about coaching and uh, alf it was like all the people there there were six people there but all the, the coaches that i have helped me coach during the camp were moms and dads that help run the, the town we call it town soccer just in the community and they're just they want to just they want just stuff you know mm -hmm. and you know i showed them the progression that i uh learned through you and and it but it's just a lot because there it's like oh my gosh they don't know 
Mm. But I'm like, and I'm talking like, oh, it's like this, 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 this. But they could just take a little something and they could do this one drill every week because they could do one session, the same session every week because the kids mm. wouldn't know any difference. You end with something fun. Um, so there is a need for that. And the, the, the female coaching is so important. Um, I mean, um, the uh, corner and the other way. Yeah. I mean, a a Emma Hayes, who's did great at Chelsea. She's an English lady, a fantastic, fantastic coach. I think, I believe she's a Curva fan too. But um, like, here, I don't want to be controversial. How the US have got an icon, a legend like you, who could actually give this message, could recruit so many talented ex-players back into the game. You, you are very rare. Mm, I mean, I there's so. a few of you that could have got the credibility that's that's what it is right yeah. in the end it's always your credibility everybody's an expert in football you know you've got italy france etc oh yeah you, holland everybody's an expert but you have got that credibility and the women's game is is has so much potential to grow whereas the men's game doesn't in my view yeah. and, and you're like a jewel in the whole thing you know, mm -hmm. and and and, and uh, anyway, we'll, we'll keep going because I yeah. just think the U.S. should utilize people, uh, icons like you. Thanks. Okay, just just to finish then, um, and Alf mentioned it, uh, Christine. So Alf and Charlie, co-founder of Curva Coaching, and about 150 of us from 40 countries are going to be gathering next week at Adidas headquarters in Herzo in Germany to celebrate 40 years of Curva coaching. Uh, and, you know, as, as someone who's been as close as you have uh, to Curva coaching throughout your life, just what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Uh, it's amazing that it's been that long. But I think if you, every time I hear off talking, he's like, oh, we've created this, we've created that. So what him and Charlie have done is they've grown. They've grown with the game. They started with just the ball masteries and then they've grown into something this. And now we're talking about the winning zone, you know, or so they're trying to continue to grow with the game. They're trying to continue to grow their coaching um, by, you know, broadening what they've created. And the fact that it's been 40 years and what <laughs> you have offered um, the soccer world it's pretty amazing. I mean, every time I hear Alf, he's like, well, I'm in Antigua. I'm in here. I'm over here. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. But it's because of the love of the game and that he wants to share it. And they've created um, the Curver Coaching, which is it works. And it's a it's a method and a philosophy and a love that they've created for 40 years. And the fact that they're still talking to each other, that's awesome. <laughs> Just about, <laughs> but that's hard. That's hard because um, you, you know, you have your beliefs. But I think what they've done together has been amazing, and the fact that they let me come in and be a part of this journey, uh, I am so grateful. You're a big part, Christine. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, uh, and your your inspiration and uh, your <laughs> stories. Um, it's been a real pleasure, and Alf, as always. Um, so we wish you well um, in the coming season, and thank I'm you. Sure, sure we'll all connect again soon. So thanks yeah, very yeah. much.